watch the video. Because I that were the critiques of so many people. So many people. People might be trickling in a little bit, but we do want to be strict with our time. So um, we're going to start, this is session three, and this is room C. So the hashtag for this particular room is C3. <coughs> so if you do want to, if you're watching us live, and if you want to ask questions or make comments, we're going to try and keep up with those. Uh, but this is, so the, the additional hashtag is C3 for this room. So this panel is called Screen Grab, and I'm really excited about this panel. Um, as an international scholar myself, um, I'm really, really um, excited because we have a bunch of international scholars and, and people who study communities, uh, groups, individuals, who are very often underrepresented, underheard, undervoiced, uh, in both the sort of mainstream discourse and even the scientific discourse. So um, today's panel is looking at uh, the impact of technology, social media, uh, internet related technologies um, on activism, on social movements, on uh, you know community organizing and, and other different things in many different countries. So I'm hoping that what you will hear from the presenters today is going to be something new that might give you a new outlook on how different underrepresented communities and international communities you know engage with these technologies and how they sort of make make their own meaning that might not necessarily coincide with the mainstream the western sort of flow that we are so used to talking about so our presenters today are Masa Ali Mardani from the University of Amsterdam uh, Izul Zulkarnain, from, uh, who's a visiting professor at Hobart and William Smith College. Um, Achim Koch, who is a student at the Graduate Center at CUNY. And Andre Hackel and Little Miss Hot Mess, who are both doctoral students. Andre is a doctoral student at AU, um, and Hot, Hot Mess is a doctoral student at NYU. So we got um, a whole lot of wonderful people for you, and I'm going to give the floor to Masa so that she can tell us about the repertoire, the digital repertoires of the women's movement in Iran. Thanks, Tanya. was really sneaky. It was there before. <laughs> but um, So I'm talking about the feminist movement and how it sort of takes shape online in Iran. And uh, my background is studying information controls inside of Iran, so a lot of censorship studies and com combined with social movement studies. So in particular, my study is sort of inspired by my own personal uh, background, which is looking at my two Iranian grandmothers who are very different. But at the same time, I feel like they sort of um, embody what Iranian feminism <coughs> uh, So my maternal grandmother is a kind of a very secular individual. She was, I guess, empowered in a Western sense. She was working all throughout her life. She was educated in Europe. But my paternal grandmother was, um, she came sort of from a different social class and she was illiterate, but, and she never really worked. She was kind of um, a stay at home mom and raised eight children. But at the same time, one of them was quite traditional, the other one was quite secular, and I guess 
modern in the, a more uh, mainstream sense, but they both contributed to creating a family that has feminist ideals, and they both sort of embody what Iranian feminism is, which is sort of this combination and hybrid of indigenous feminism combined with a little bit of secular um, characteristics. And so when the um, Islamic Revolution happened in Iran, you sort of have, um, you have this effort of the government trying to impose a traditional sense of femi femininity, but um, at the same time, this kind of empowered it in a counterintuitive way, like uh, because uh, mandatory hijab was enforced, a mountain that a lot of traditional women could come out into society and go into universities. And so uh, university rates really um, kind of increased in ways that didn't occur when there was a secular government in place. And so because of these different sort of opportunities and at the same time these different drawbacks, you have this very um, uh, unique indigenous form of feminism that has arisen. And um, so what a lot of feminist scholars inside of Iran say is that um, women are sort of jumping over the fences and not necessarily being given opportunities by the government or the environment in place, but they've sort of found unique ways to circumvent things and go about um, opening their own sort of gates, but rather not opening gates, not having the gates open, but rather like jumping over fences. And um, so what I focus on is how the government tries to control the narrative and the content related to women's rights in Iran. And so cyberspace has proved this great opportunity for initially when it was introduced in Iran, this great opportunity for Iranian journalists and bloggers to go into this unrestricted space and talk and have their voices heard and blog about um, issues pertaining to women's rights, women's empowerment. And so it um, was this liberating territory initially. But once um, internet controls kind of came into place, it became more and more uh, restricted. And so you have this period during the reformist era when there was this emergence of reformist uh, journalists, female journalists coming and sort of um, directly asking for certain rights, uh, asking to repeal the unequal laws that, were that are enshrined in the Islamic constitution. And so there was a crackdown on this in 2006 when there was a cyber crimes bill, and um, this became a heavily restricted space. Um, the government has tried to sort of create their own narrative around this through various um, tools. Uh, one of them would be social media. For example, you have the supreme leader who's in essence the head of state who has <coughs> his own sort of um, campaign called Khamenei Rehane, which tries to instill his image of what the ideal Iranian woman should be. And sort of the active policies of censorship <coughs> in the ways that they sort of shut down and filter certain um, feminist magazines like Zanon, which is one of the oldest ones since the reformist era. And so this has forced a lot of activists to go underground or go into exile. And um, what I sort of look at are the different platforms now that have become essential to the feminist movement. And one of them is um, Facebook. Uh, Facebook has become this uh, place where a lot of campaigns have emerged. And one that's gained considerable amount of traction is My Stealthy Freedom, which is this uh, campaign f that is asking to repeal mandatory hijab for women. And it's kind of become a new movement in the sense that you have women from all sectors of Iranian society coming out and um, making their presence known. Um, in the research that I'm doing, I looked at amongst the My Stealthy Freedom page and a number of other different pages to sort of look at what kind of content they're putting out and to see where they're located. Are they inside of Iran? Are they outside of Iran? And I'm trying to see if the content that they are um, talking about and pushing forward in this sort of sphere is either being controlled and blocked inside of Iran or not. And my study showed that um, three of the pages were inside of Iran, three of the pages were outside of Iran, but um, a lot of the content 
uh, was is distributed amongst English Western sources and um, Iranian diaspora news sources, and it proved that most of about half of the content was um, blocked. These are this is the pie chart of all the blocked content. So it's mainly Iranian diaspora blogs and Iranian diaspora news and Western news that's being discussed by these Facebook pages that deal with things like um, domestic violence inside of Iran, the mandatory hijab campaign, and equality for men and women that is campaigning to change the constitution. Um, another part of my study also looked at how 140 Iranian women inside of the country kind of think about um, uh, how they use the internet and online campaigning to empower themselves. And I asked various questions and the main takeaways I got <coughs> were that most of the women who were going online had a lot of political goals and um, were sort of pushing to uh, voice their opinions on women's rights. And, um, but how they perceive the impact of these online campaigns on actual authorities and changing policies was very little. But on the other side, they sort of saw it coming through in international media and international organizations, and in fact, them putting pressure and changing the quality and the environment towards um, women's rights and how restrictive sort of um, the implementation of policies are on the ground. And um, yeah, that, that's kind of a quick overview of what I'm doing. Um, but the main takeaways, I guess, are is that Iran has a very um, empowered feminist society, but the policies aren't necessary, necessarily feminist. And um, the Iranian women's rights discourse is lively, despite the fact that there are a lot of controls over the internet and how the information flows in the country. And it relies on a network of transnational advocacy organizations to sort of bring this about and um, various different international actors at play. And that's about it. Thank you. All right, so while, while our next presenter, Izu, is pulling up his slides, I'm going to briefly uh, introduce his talk. His talk is called Nationalistic Networked Publics, the Use of Social Media as a Nationalistic Platform in Indonesia. So we've just traveled to Iran, now we're moving to Indonesia. <coughs> Um, and if I could ask the presenters to, to if you want to turn the mic towards yourself, but please try to speak into the mic because the quality of the audio on the live stream depends on the mic. Yay? Good. Awesome. Thank you for coming to this panel. And so I just want to give a brief um, background about this uh, presentation. This is part of my uh, book project. So my research is actually about Indonesian digital nationalism. So I'm going to talk about uh, nationalist activism <coughs> using social media platforms in Indonesia. So my presentation today is about a phenomenon in Indonesian social media culture called upacara digital or digital flag, digital flag raising ceremony. This ceremony had been organized annually from 2010 to 2014 in celebration of the Indonesian Independence Day on August 17. The organizer of this annual event is a self-described social media activist group called Indonesia Optimist or Optimistic Indonesia. Hereafter, I will refer to as Optimist. The rationale behind uh, Optimist's motivation to set up the digital ceremony was to counter negative expressions about Indonesia by Indonesian digital generation online and to share optimism about Indonesian national identity in the digital sphere. Optimist's digital ceremony utilized various social media platforms, particularly Twitter, to promote what the group claims as a new model of nationalism in Indonesia. And I characterize this model as distributed nationalism a model of digital nationalism that draws attention to the distributive qualities of social media in constructing what I call a nationalist network public, the kind of public that attempt to restructure nationalist conception using network platforms such as uh, social media. And just to be clear, 
And just to be clear, uh, that my presentation here is a critic of, of optimistic model of nationalist network public. Here, I will argue that um, while at the outset, optimistic exclusive reliance on social media platforms in the group's organization of the ceremony seems to suggest the creation of a pro progressive popular nationalist movement, it has also exposed the self-indulgence of many Indonesian uh, middle class people who are detached from the everyday realities of common Indonesians. To explicate this, I frame optimistic digital ceremony as an instance of what Paulo Gerbaudo calls choreography of assembly. A process of symbolic construction of public space, which facilitates and guides the physical assembling of a highly dispersed and individualized constituency demonstrated in contemporary political activisms. As a choreographed assembly event, Optimist's digital ceremony bears a resemblance to contemporary activisms worldwide, such as the 2011 Egyptian uprising. The similarity can be seen from how the collective leverages the distributed nature of social media to create a loose network of participants with a relaxed form of leadership. While Optimus is the motor behind the ceremony, the group does not position themselves as a leader, but rather as the principal choreographer. Involved in setting the scene for the ceremony, just like the figure of a wild gonim in the case of 2011 Egyptian protests. What's more, much like the other contemporary social movements, Optimist's ceremony has exploited social media platforms as emotional conduits for nationalist expressions. The proceedings of Optimist's digital ceremony utilize four digital platforms, Twitter, Foursquare, Optimist's webpage, and YouTube, with Twitter operating as the primary nav navigation center. <coughs> Through its utilization of these uh, platforms, Optimist's, Optimist as a social choreographer condenses the individual sentiments of pride and shared identity of its network public, and transforms them into nationalist passions during the proceedings of the digital, cere of the digital ceremony. The participants' action was necess necessary here to transform Twitter, Foursquare, YouTube, and Optimist's website into markers of an affective Indonesian national space. Following Optimist's live tweets, tweeting their own feelings about the ceremony with others using unique Twitter hashtag, clicking icons on the group's website, and checking in at the National's Proclamation mon Monument online were therefore necessary action for people to engage fully in the digital event and to construct a nationalist network public. The result can be quite telling. By Optimist's standard, the first three years of its organization were very successful. The ceremonies drew a large amount of online participants, both from the Indonesian region and abroad. The collective was also able to secure high-profile figures as, this, as their ceremony speakers and receive a national coverage, as well as accomplish a viral status based on social media's quantitative indicator. During the ceremony, the participants also shared their nationalist and patriotic sentiments explicitly online. Some of them, in fact, went as far as tweeting pictures showing them saluting in front of the monitor while participating in the ceremony. Now, however, there is a glaring dif difference between Optimist's choreography of assembly and that of contemporary social activism. The collective's flag raising ceremony limits its assembly only to the digital realm. So, unlike the emotional condensation facilitated by the We Are Khaled Said Facebook page in Egypt, which led to massive protests in Tahrir Square, the emotional condensation in Optimist's ceremony remains in, in a symbolic and immaterial state on Optimist's website and its Twitter timeline. In fact, uh, the group publicly states that the ceremony is held solely in the digital format in order to make it progressive and unique, because a physical ceremony is, according to the collective, to quote, hot, tiring, boring, and related to the authoritarian regime, end quote. Now, elsewhere, I explore how, despite its progressive claim, Optimist's digital ceremony still aligns with the authoritarian model of nationalism that the collective seeks to resist. And here I want to add to my critic by arguing that Optimist's insistence on, resti on restricting its affective ceremony solely to the digital realm in the name of convenience also speaks to the detachment of many network Indonesian middle class young people, the main audience of, the di of its digital ceremony, from the everyday realities of common, common Indonesians. 
To be fair, this may not be Optimus' de deliberate intention. However, considering the group's inability to concretely channel the emotional condensation of nationalist spirit that it choreographs beyond its digital ceremony, Optimus' nationalist so social media activism and its construction of the nationalist network public do appear to be merely a feel-good activism for its participants, particularly a type of egoistic Indonesian middle class, notoriously known as class menengangehe, or the middle class quote-unquote assholes. <laughs> the term class menengangehe has recently circulated in Indo Indonesian popular discourse to describe a type of Indonesian middle class individuals who are selfish, overly consumptive, and who have a lack of compassion for poorer, less network Indonesians. The emergence of this type of middle class is arguably due to steady growth in, Indonesian, in Indonesia's economy. The class menengangehe is also a fluid marker for class differentiation in Indonesia. The poor Indonesians use the term to characterize a type of class above them who, to quote, do not want to endure hardship or trouble, end quote. Meanwhile, the prosperous segments of Indonesian populations uses the term as a derogatory identifier for the nouveau riches who flaunt their vulgar behavior. One thing, however, remains constant in the term's usage. The framing of the class menengangehe is always related to consumption patterns and lifestyle. <coughs> in this case, social media platforms like Twitter and Foursquare, Optimist's preferred applications for its flag raising ceremony, have become the favorite platforms for the class menengangehe to display, to display their consumer lifestyle as well as fan their displeasures. The initial image of Twitter as the what I had for lunch medium uh, perfectly caters to many Indonesians' need for social acknowledgement about their middle class status. The platform is also popular among the Indonesian middle class uh, because as Gerbaudo suggests in his discussion of the elitist Twitter activists in Egypt, it entails a higher level of education and a better knowledge of English language than do other social media platforms like Facebook. Uh, similarly, location-based social media platform like Foursquare uh, is used to exhibit the Indonesian middle class's high mobility and conspicuous consumption. Thus, updating their Twitter and Foursquare status when they visit hip, upscale restaurants or cineplexes has become an addictive behavior for some Indonesians to claim and maintain their middle class membership. There's an, an irony here, because it is the self-indulgence of the class menengangehe that might have motivated Optimus' nationalist social media activism in the first place. This is possibly where the group's imagined audience transforms into a concrete segment of the social classes. When Optimus promoted its model of distributed nationalism by choreographing its annual digital ceremony, the people captivated by this model were the class menengah themselves. The proceedings became an ideal means by which to prove that even though they are self-seeking individuals, they are still nationalist Indonesians. The fact that the ceremony does not require a physical congregation adds to its appeal for the class menengangehe. In the end, Optimus' digital flag raising ceremony generates a perverse feedback loop where its choreography of assembly functions as a self-comforting self activism against a pejorative type of the Indonesian middle class by the Indonesian middle class and for the convenience of the Indonesian middle class with no intentions of being on the streets or intermingling with the other and perhaps lower social classes. Now, I want to close my presentation by pointing out that while my analysis of Optimus' digital flag raising ceremony demonstrates the disconnect between emotional condensation in virtual space and social activism in physical space, it also highlights the belief of the Indonesian digital generation in the promises of both nationalism and the digital as mutually liberating concepts. We can consequently perceive the coupling of national and digital imaginings in Optimus' digital flag raising ceremony as an emergent strategy for the Indonesian digital generation to assert themselves into global digital culture on their own terms. Yet, as we have seen 
in the case of Optimus' misstep choreography of assembly, this fusion of digital nationalism carries its own problem. In the end, I'm hoping that we may learn something from this case study in an effort to gain a better understanding of the novel circumstances prompted by the global circulation of digital technologies. Thank you. This is really good, almost perfect timing so far. I really love this panel. People are either early or on time. Let's keep it that way. So our next uh, panelist, while he's pulling up um, his presentation, Achim Koh is going to talk to us about the year 2015 and Korean online feminism. And he's going to talk to us about two movements against misogyny in the Korean online sphere. And we're going to try and lower the mic to see if we don't break it. Or you can just take it off. Um, that's sure. Okay. And I can take this away so that it doesn't get. You should have done this early. <laughs> Hi, uh, please excuse my reading from my laptop. I'll try to act like I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my name is Achim Ko, um, <clears throat> and uh, today I'm going to talk about two online movements related to feminism which happened in South Korea in 2015. I usually try to focus on what people do with the internet and how that is shaping the contemporary South Korean society. And for those of you who are not familiar with the country, it's in East Asia. Oh, sorry. Wait. Yep. <laughs> this is right. And uh, a very, very uh, brief version of South Korean history is that um, it has gone through a very um, fast-paced economic development in the 20th century, driven by a patriarchic military capitalism, which pretty much defines the cultural norms until now. Uh, this could mean a lot of things, including gender inequality. This is from the um, World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report, 2015. And um, in 2013, women were paid 30% um, less and were employed 23% less than men. Um, and there are just there has been a legislative election just a few days ago and the ratio of women in the National Assembly is 17 percent which is the highest ever in the history of the country yay and uh, <laughs> also the <coughs> the violence against women is um, in an alarming state um, so among the victims of violent crimes around 30 percent were women in the 90s but however, um, it has increased to more than 80% in the 2010s. And uh, in 2015, at least one woman was murdered by her partner every four days, only counting those reported in the news. So um, the feminist movement's pr presence was not very impressive in the last decade in South Korea, which is also related to the pervasive misogyny which was addressed by the online movements, which are the topic of this talk. I'll talk more about this later on, but let me just say that um, the dominant language on the South Korean web is very aggressive towards the minority, including women, and the w um, yeah, also the word feminist is practically a stigma. And now this hashtag translates to um, I am a hashtag I am a feminist. For those of you who cannot read or type Korean, the, that's the link to the sweet Twitter search of this hashtag. And I'm not going to go into very much details, but this hashtag movement was ignited by two mentions of ISIL and feminism together. So this is a, from a S South Korean teenager who eventually joined ISIL after tweeting this. And um, this is a pop columnist who goes very far to make a comparison based on a very extre extremely uh, narrow definition of feminism. And also, uh, while people were talking about this on Twitter, there was this other guy who went like, I'm not a feminist, but feminism should um, blah, blah, blah. So 
some people uh, started using the hashtag in order to problematize the negative social construction of the term through self-identification as a feminist. And um, if my data is correct, um, there were about 5,000 tweets with this hashtag in um, 2015. So it's not, a, it wasn't a particularly big movement, but it opened up some interesting discussions um, both um, in quality and volume. So, for example, uh, about seven, 70,000 tweets in, um, excuse me, about 70,000 tweets uh, included the term feminist or feminism after 2015 compared to less than half um, from all the time before that. And this also led to um, offline actions like walks and social gatherings. And I think it's safe to say that this movement laid the ground for this other movement, which is called uh, Megalion. So the name is a compound word of uh, MERS, the virus, and Egalion, referencing uh, Gerard Brantenberg's satire novel, Egalia's Daughters, which pictures a society where oppressive uh, gender roles are reversed. Uh, yeah, this is not an important image, but I just wanted to <laughs> Anyway, um, to, uh, to simplify again, um, users in the Mars board of DCinside.com, which is a 4chan-like website, were slamming women for bringing the virus to Korea, uh, whereas compassion was being given to male patients. And some female users decided to claim the board in protest to this asymmetric criticism. And they started to flood the board with posts uh, parodying stereotypical statements about men and women with genders reversed, named Megalian with literature. Uh, so early examples went like, um, this or uh, this, uh, which is both funny and tragic because this is actually what men say about women in Korea. So um, <coughs> lots of women start, started to share their stories both in uh, plain language and also in this Megalian literary style. And uh, many new vocabularies were created, uh, which I'm not going to explain in detail because it's very <coughs> profane, but many of which refer to the average, average size of male genitalia, hence the logo. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> over overseas prostitution trips, which is also a thing in South Korea, and in response to sexist slangs referring to women. Another interesting term which was popularized was um, safe breakup pointing to the many occasions of men's violence towards women who broke up with them, including murder, revenge, porn, and acid throwing. Uh, I'm a bit uh, behind, so I'm going to skip some of OK, so um, after a massive trolling war, this uh, movement went on to uh, also organized real life actions, including um, with donations to women's rights organizations and uh, some political lobbies, uh, including the ones which problematized uh, revenge porn and led to the recent shutting down of the biggest Korean porn site, uh, which is uh, called Soranet. And um, yeah, so I guess. Uh, to put it in Judith, Judith Butler's words, such activities, especially the activities of reversing the gender, were, were a redeployment of language which uses that word but also displays it and points to it, and by doing so becomes an instrument of resistance. And uh, oh god, I should have I should have had five minutes now. So <laughs> I'm gonna like rush. So a lot of what the resistant language of uh, these um, Megalians refer back uh, comes from this website, which is like the engine of hate in the South Korean web. Uh, it's called Irba.com, and um, 
is probably most similar to what would result in a combination of the random board of 4chan.org and the Tea Party. And <laughs> it's a very, very popular site in South Korea. And, uh, and like 4chan, the massive competition for LOLs constitutes an attention economy which results in a uh, massive hate, hate speech competition towards the minority we, who are depicted as whining free riders. And this website is, uh, I guess, a clinical example of how the internet is used in a way which reflects or reinforces gender inequality in South Korea. Some researchers have tried to explain the website's massive popularity considering its profanity. And to them, and this is the authoritarian and submissive subject manifesting itself, which seeks something like a group identity through hate in the absence of the collective goals of the 20th century, which were holding them together, like Cold War anti-communism and military industrial development. In that sense, um, I think, um, no, I, yeah, I think I'm, gonna, I'm not going to skip. So in that sense, <laughs> sorry, hate, which is the dominant effect in the 21st century South Korea, could also be explained as um, the other side of the coin, which is the cruel optimism as described by Roland Ballant. Uh, in her book, she refers to cruel optimism as the um, to paraphrase, the desire and belief towards a good life, which among other things promises upward mobility, but because of this very belief fails to address the impossible condition of such desire in the current days, which only perpetuates the precarious situation. Similarly, the hate manifested in Ilba.com is in a way a desperate attempt to maintain the promise of traditional compensation for hardworking citizens, along the way alienating the minority, but is but its own submissive belief in the system impairs the ability to perceive that the system is failing to deliver. And one major mechanism this hate is being engendered through is through anonymous online platforms. And I'm getting close to my point now. Uh, such platforms exercise normative power which results in the selective display and performance of online identities by users. Some might choose not to identify as feminists in order to avoid uh, mansplainers. Or in some cases, not disclosing your gender will be very helpful to your actual physical safety. And uh, this is one of the reasons I wanted to bring up the two online movements I mentioned today, which were both started in anonymous or pseudonymous platforms. And I can describe Twitter as a pseudonymous platform because not many people use their real names in South Korean Twitter, relatively. And so these movements um, problematize and repurpose the sexist language common on the South Korean web in general. And to summarize, the issue of identity was important in both movements. They resulted in an increased volume of discussion on gender, making issues more visible. And this is something I didn't take time to explain, but from both movements came voluntary organizers who did not necessarily have ties or activist backgrounds, but went on to pursue offline actions to, uh, offline actions, excuse me, some of which ex involved existing organizations. Um, to close, um, these two movements are for me interesting use cases of anonymous platforms. Uh, which are leveraged to engage the issue of gender and identity, both online and offline, against, uh, against certain power structures related to social gender inequality. In other words, cases which, which could be counterexamples to the apparent tendency of the internet in gendering hate, like it is the case in South Korea. Thank you. Do you want to sit, stand? What do you want to do? I'm, I'm just going to stand there. OK, well, then the mixed end will bring back. So our, our last two wonderful panelists, Andrea and Little Miss Hot Mess, are going to talk about online platforms, policy designs, and minority expression. And that's a fairly broad title, so I'm sure they'll be more specific about what it is exactly that their, their, um, their research is about. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, I, I don't really need it. I can pull it. Thank you. 
Okay, my name is Andrea Hackel. I'm very excited to be here, and I'm specifically excited to be presenting with Little Miss Hot Mess, who's really been a key force in bringing the real name issue on Facebook to the forefront. So I'm very excited to be here and that we're presenting together. So we will be talking about online platforms, policy designs, and minority expression. And I kind of want to set the stage and talk a little bit about why online platforms matter for minority communities, such as LGBTQ communities, before I turn it over to Little Miss Hot Mess, who's going to talk more about the um, My Name is Campaign. So the question at the center of our paper and our study is, how do online platforms and their policy and technological design mediate minority expression, privacy, and safety? Um, and I, I first want to talk a little bit more about why vulnerable communities rely so much on the online sphere in the, or online platforms in their daily lives. Um, communicating, associating online, minority communities, specifically in, in countries with repressive information communication re regimes, turn to the online sphere, which is sometimes the only platform they have to communicate, build community, and associate. And of course, um, in our daily communication, in our daily online communication, minority communities rely on an ecosystem of online platforms ranging from mainstream social media platforms like Facebook, search intermediaries like Google, as well as platforms that more specifically cater to minority communities. For example, for the LGBT community, this might be location-based dating apps such as Grindr, Scruff, or Her. And one of the concerns that has been raised in scholarship is that private internet companies and their policy and technological designs have an increasingly important role in mediating civil liberties given their very significant user base uh, in, a, in a global context. Um, and while we kind of never pay money to use most of these platforms, the use of these platforms of, of course is never free because we kind of give up our data in exchange for services. And the data collected may range from private information such as real names, as we will see later, to email addresses, to home addresses, to metadata like device information or locational data. And as we will see in a little bit, that has very, very significant implications for minority users. And we want to talk specifically about two examples that kind of exemplify and illustrate how the data collection procedures by online platforms impact the privacy and safety of minority users. Um, the first example I want to discuss is Grindr, which is a very popular gay dating app with a user base of millions of, of users worldwide and it's also the largest network among gay, in, um, gay, bisexual, and queer men in a global context. And um, the app allows users to look for other men in their physical surroundings, which of course is based on the collection of locational data, which is on the one hand, of course, a great opportunity for men to meet each other, but on the other hand, raises significant safety concerns. And in 2014, these concerns really kind of reached the, the public and, and media discourse when Egyptian LGBTQ activists um, came out saying, okay, I think police in the country has used locational data to track down gay men. And um, similar stories like this emerged in, in other countries, like Russia, for example. And while the company at first remain silent ab about these claims, they later responded by saying, okay, we're gonna turn off locational data tracking in countries with strong anti-LGBTQ records. And taking not a proactive, but a reactive step in protecting the safety of global LGBTQ users. And as we will see in the, ne the next example, 
this kind of response is unfortunately not the norm. And that brings us to the Facebook real name example. Um, in, fall, in fall 2014, Facebook came under public criticism after a wave of terminations of Facebook accounts belonging to drag queens, transgender individuals, domestic violence, victims, and other vulnerable communities. And uh, Facebook has had relied on its users to flag, to flag those using a fake name. And a user had really taken advantage of this tool to target minority communities. And with, uh, while Facebook initially did not respond to user concerns about the issue, there were two campaigns, the My Name is Campaign and the Nameless Coalition, who really b brought this issue to the forefront and made sure we we're all yeah, aware of the, the negative implications of this. And with this, I'm going to turn it over to a little Ms. Hermes, who's going to talk more about the My Name is Campaign. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'm Little Miss Hot Mess. I'm a drag queen. I'm um, a organizer with the My Name Is campaign, and I'm also a PhD student in media studies. Um, but today I'm talking mainly sort of from my perspective as someone who organized with this campaign. Um, so Andre gave some of the background. Um, I just want to say, so yeah, this started in September of 2014 um, when a bunch of us drag queens in San Francisco and other major cities were targeted. We sort of immediately came together, started threatening protests, and then quickly got the attention of Facebook. Um, so it sort of began this series of negotiations that ended up leading um, to protests, a lot of meetings, a lot of empty hot air from Facebook, um, and a few small changes that I'll talk about later. Um, so just to give a little background on how it works, like Andrea said, um, names policing is primarily based on user reporting. Um, and the idea basically is that Facebook allegedly wants users to use, originally they, they were saying real names, which was sort of conflated with legal name. Um, and then they changed the policy to say authentic identities um, that reflect how users are known in real life. Um, so there's a lot of ambiguity still in that definition. Um, and they do rely on user reporting um, and ID generally government ID-based uh, verification if you are flagged. Um, and so part of the way that the My Name Is campaign got started is that we were approached by many different communities of users, um, both in the US internationally, and I'll talk about some of those in a second. Um, but I also just wanted to sort of emphasize um, the shock and trauma might be too big of a word, but the, the hurt that actually does come from losing access to Facebook. I think for many of us in the US, we see it as a time suck and um, this platform that a lot of us wish that we could get away from. Um, but what we kept hearing from the people who were contacting us is that this actually was a platform that was critical to organizing. Um, it was critical to building community, to receiving support, especially for users who are otherwise um, fairly vulnerable. Um, so this is an image from one of our protests um, at the San Francisco Pride Parade. Um, a lot of the organizing sort of happened in San Francisco because of its proximity to Silicon Valley. Um, we ended up making a lot of headlines internationally as well. Um, and this is just a, a quick screenshot of the sort of softer tone they took after our initial protests. Um, it used to just, basically originally they would lock users out and then give you the option of giving your legal name, which effectively outed a lot of people, um, especially queer and trans people who might have been using other names for reasons of privacy. Um, and they've instituted some small changes. Um, so I just wanted to say that this, this is highlights some of the sort of values that different communities invoke when they um, sort of make claims for the right to, to self-determination in using um, names that may not be their legal identities. Um, so a lot of people talk about authenticity, so queer and trans users, um, different groups of people of color, ethnic minorities, like I said, Native Americans, African Americans. Um, we heard from Gaelic-speaking communities in both Ireland and Scotland. Uh, many of these communities, their names don't fit to sort of standard Anglo naming conventions. They might include punctuation or spaces or use of nouns, what seem like nouns proper uh, as part of their names. Um, safety, so we did hear from a lot of survivors of domestic and sexual violence and other forms of bullying and abuse, um, political dissidents, especially outside of the US, sex workers and immigrants, 
um, for whom being exposed under their legal name could actually have very um, dangerous repercussions. Um, sort of other concerns of privacy, we heard from a lot of different professionals um, in healthcare, the justice system, education, journalism, who maybe didn't share the same safety concerns, but were looking to have a little bit of a buffer between their professional lives and their clients. Um, of course, issues of autonomy and sort of being able to define yourself, so um, artists, performers. Uh, underlying that, there are sort of these issues of connectivity, like I mentioned, so this is a platform that's used for resource sharing, um, support, and also business for a lot of people. A lot of people are, are required to have a Facebook account um, as part of their job. Um, and then, of course, expression, um, that Facebook sort of serves as a contemporary public forum. Um, so I just want to share a couple of testimonials. One of the, okay, I'm gonna share them really quickly. Um, so one of the things that our campaign did was uh, start to compile, and there's a website, mynameiscampaign.org, um, that compiles a lot of these testimonials. So this is someone who says, I am a transgender person who has gone through a few periods of testing names out to see if they fit, and ultimately deciding on the nickname my mother gave me when I was a toddler, and the last name I was born with. I have relatives that I am not wanting to be in contact with for safety reasons, and Facebook has allowed these individuals, as well as individuals that I was domestically abused by, to contact me using names I no longer use in my daily life. Um, so th a lot of these themes came up again and again. Um, someone who describes not being, who was trans and who was stealth or not out at work um, and feared for their physical safety. Um, they also say, on a less dramatic note, the forced name change resulted in losing numerous friends who didn't know who I was, countless missed tags and invites, and a dramatic decline in comments, likes, and variety of people appearing in my newsfeed. Um, so again, things that may not seem super dramatic actually do have large impacts on uh, minority uh, and vulnerable communities. Um, and, and also we saw that this was often used as a form of harassment, um, especially towards some of the users I've talked about, and, and even to just, you know, not just, but to, to women all around the world um, who were enduring many different forms of harassment, and this just became yet another form um, in the arsenal of cyber bullies. Um, so then, just to cover some of the sort of underlying issues, um, like we've talked about cyberbullying, uh, sort of restricts expression. Um, uh, there's sort of an algorithmic and cultural bias happening here, so um, without getting too far into it, part of the way that when you're flagged, um, Facebook evaluates where to send you um, is through an algorithmic process. So like I said, non-standard names um, might not pass that, and I think this also sort of speaks to the Silicon Valley monoculture that doesn't really understand many different forms of diversity. Um, there's a sense that realness is complicated, um, so how we live our lives, even in real life, doesn't necessarily translate um, conveniently into digital spaces. Um, and that as a feature-rich platform, it's really sort of invoking many different senses of self based on its different features. Um, so there's sort of conflict there. Um, there's a lack of due process. Uh, so in a corporate controlled environment like Facebook, they are really the judge, jury, and executioner. They, you don't really have much recourse to appeal. Um, and then the sense that Facebook, I think, you know, at at best, Facebook is sort of seen as this way of connecting. In a, at worst, it's often seen as um, an advertising platform, but I think we really need to think about what the real purpose of it is um, and why names themselves are an important data point for Facebook um, beyond selling advertising. So I think integrations with other um, platforms like Uber as a sort of identity verifier, um, and then things like the patents that we've seen for um, assessing people's creditworthiness based on the social graph. So things where Facebook is actually extending further and further into our real um, and fiduciary lives. Um, and then finally, and I, I see that, um, just the sense that Facebook makes the argument that um, that by using your real name, you are more accountable and more authentic. And I think that there are many studies that show that actually allowing pseudonyms um, and different forms of speech uh, enable uh, better interactions. So I'll stop there. We have some recommendations that we can talk about maybe in the Q&A. Thank you. So thank you all so much. Those were some fascinating presentations. Now we have about 21 minutes left for some questions. So uh, I just want to say to sort of summarize what we've heard that, you know, it's 
often easy to imagine the internet um, as this sort of global space without borders, which you know, enables us all to do all these many things. But actually, it's much more complicated because we have all these cultural differences and all these cultural histories, um, histories of misogyny or histories of you know what is safety and being public to some may not be absolutely or maybe absolutely different to, to someone else. And even within one country, we may have totally different traditions of feminism and feminist expression and what it means to be feminist, depending on which kind of family you were brought up in and then how that results in the kind of behavior you might engage in online or offline. So uh, with that, um, I want to open the floor for questions. If anybody has questions for any of the participants. I can't believe you can, don't have any questions. It's amazing. All right, so I've actually got a question for um, for uh, our team to start with. So you were talking about both um, platforms that are sort of you know owned and run by Western companies and also local websites. Um, would you, when you when you looked at them and looked at the kind of ways that people behaved um, on them in terms of like these campaigns and reaction to them and what they were caused by? Would you say there was a difference in how people sort of present themselves and how they engage with each other on, on sort of thing, places like Facebook or Twitter, and then also these, these more local platforms, which are probably mostly entirely in Korean and, and are run by you know, Korean companies? Actually, I, I'm going to need some, a few seconds. sort of reiterate the same question and, and uh, ask Masa this question. So in terms of how, um, what well, you, you were talking about, sort of the difference between like the English language spaces and, you know, so would you say there's like a different approach to promoting certain ideas or certain, say, feminist uh, perspectives on, on platforms where you know there's going to be a, a international audience as opposed to platforms where the audience is mostly in country? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. My study sort of looked at how the Iranian government was reacting to different content in different languages. And um, so the government reacts, is more sensitive towards anything that's in the Persian language. And one of the case studies, I didn't explicitly talk about it, um, Zanon, which is a uh, one of the oldest uh, feminist magazines, it translates... Uh, early sort of feminist theorists like Mary Wollstonecraft into Persian. And they're quite uh, sensitive towards this. And it's one of the platforms they've made an effort to shut down. Physically, they've shut down their offices. And online, they filtered them and uh, continually harassed the editors and the journalists. So there's that kind of sensitivity towards it. And it intermingles with the fact that um, uh, the feminism and the issues sort of, they're both local and they draw on the wider international context and it sort of filters it down into the government reacting to it and then um, the movement or the different campaigns that are going on in Iran outsource and draw on uh, English content and share it and obviously there's a ubiquitous use of um, anti-filtering tools that enables most of these movements and these campaigns to persist. Mm -hmm. So, have an answer. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, way um, for the, uh, um, for both the hashtag movement and the, um, Megalian reversing movement. Um, the one of um, like the main platform for the hashtag movement and uh, the early platform for the uh, like one of the early uh, platform for the uh, other movement were actually Twitter, and um, I guess it um, is closely related to um, the kind of uh, local censorship, which is um, 
So there is this uh, thing called defamation law in South Korea. So you can like uh, report something, and then it'll be um, either removed or uh, hidden. Uh, but that only applies to like local companies, because um, the South Korean government wouldn't have jurisdiction over Twitter. Um, so, and I guess that um, might have uh, encouraged uh, more people to rely on foreign uh, platforms in such um, occasions. Um, I guess uh, in, ter in terms of this type of movements, uh, which were read, uh, relatively small and uh, were concentrated on um, gender issues, uh, foreign uh, companies might have provided some safe space in a sense. Uh, but then we do have a uh, history of um, like uh, the government trying to collaborate with foreign companies to in order to investigate um, residents, uh, South Korean people. So um, that's, I guess, um, on a layer to think about as uh, a movement uh, is more geared towards or more politically charged, I would say. Um, yeah, and just sorry, just to ask one thing: um, foreign uh, platforms were, were not, of course, uh, like always that great because um, the Megalian movement uh, had a pretty um, big problem with Facebook actually because um, so they were. They were engaged in a very big uh, trolling war in their original uh, website, which is basically a board system. So they moved to Facebook, and then um, people uh, started flagging the page for removal. Uh, so it got like um, it got removed three times, and then uh, it's settled on Megalion Four now, um, which is, I guess, something that could happen, but. Um, at the same time, those people were really um, also flagging very sexist pages against uh, women or against um, homosexuals. And those pages were not really um, removed that in, uh, I guess, uh, in a symmetrical way. So um, those are, I guess, tricky issues. <laughs> Any questions from the audience emerged? Oh, wonderful. Great. All right. Go ahead. Uh, Jim Bruno near me. Um, well, we might finish oh, sure. just for the sake of the live stream people. Yes, if you want to just come up. There's live stream people. Uh, that was a great panel. My name's Sam. Um, I guess this question, I'll take uh, Little Miss Hot Mess base, uh, Little Miss Hot Mess's bait, and I'm curious to hear about more any lessons that you learned as an organizer of My Name Is. Um, in dealing with kind of these private platforms that don't really have any direct, um, don't have to answer to us as citizens always. Um, and also, Masa, I'm curious to hear, uh, maybe maybe you could jump off of his response, we'll see, I don't know. Um, and, sorry, w what's your pronoun? Okay, apologies. Um, and uh, hear about any differences maybe when you're dealing with uh, more, rather than a specific uh, platform, how do we go at a huge cultural, not to say that the two aren't linked, but uh, a cultural issue like uh, misogyny or uh, specific government programs or policies? Thanks. Some in-depth questions. Um, that's a really good question. I think listening to the other panelists, one of the things that I'm thinking about now is that in some ways, our, like our campaign was about access to a social media platform. It wasn't about using a social media platform to a specific end. And so in a lot of ways, what we were doing was actually going back to sort of so-called old media. Um, so I think a lot of what made us successful was that, and 
I'll qualify that success because a lot of things still haven't changed. Um, but a lot of what got us attention was that we were able to grab the mainstream media's attention. I think mainly because anytime ten or more drag queens come out during the day and <laughs> threaten to protest, like that's going to be a bit of a spectacle, and people, the media, obviously still like spectacle. Um, so I think a lot of it is still sort of about more traditional ways of um, taking on corporations and holding them accountable to users. Um, I think that for something like this, um, developing as much, as much of a technical knowledge as you can is important. Um, and I think, you know, trying to figure out what other forms of social media can be engaged. But in reality, I mean, we used a hashtag, but this was not a Twitter-based campaign. This was not something that was really about social media. Um, it was really about, like, organizing in person, um, organizing on listservs, things like that. Um, so yeah, and, and yeah, let's, let's stop there. Well, I think your, your research and your focus on the real name policy, it does relate a lot to any form of activism that happens in Iran because um, I'm not sure if you remember, in 2009 there was a surge of Iranian Facebook users that, whose last names became Irani. And um, so, and that was mainly because they were coming on to public um, pages, they were participating in um, forums where the government could easily track and look into it. And so most of the movement and the voices that emerged during that period um, kind of had this layer of protection. And over the past year or so, a lot of Iranian activists, especially women, have come under um, have come under threat because of the fact that Facebook is now cracking down on these names and forcing them to change. And with uh, one particular campaign, My Stealthy Freedom, um, there was a counter reaction by uh, forces that many thought were part of the Revolutionary Guards inside of Iran. And their campaign was to identify the women who were exposing their hair in the pictures and to go and find them and harass them in real life. And so, um, Part of these these policies also, you know, they protect other different um, types of activism and other movements. Uh, I'm not sure if that particularly answers your question directly. Um, uh, I think you asked about how these movements are answering to uh, policies, you were saying? Well, the one campaign that I'm looking at uh, quite a bit is just a direct um, sort of assault on the mandatory hijab policy. And so the very fact that women are making themselves present on the space is, um, is, is sort of inserting itself into dialogue and discourse that's going on at the clerical level in terms of what um, certain clerics are saying at Friday prayers, even like so far as going and targeting the sort of founder of the, the movement. Um, it's sort of bringing this discourse to the fore and kind of highlighting that, okay, you have women from all social backgrounds, all social classes doing this, and it's, it's being talked about. And, and it is reverberating a little bit onto what's happening on the streets in terms of how the morality police are sometimes not as strict as they are before. And it's just little pieces of um, these reactions, which I sort of uncover through interviews and surveys that I'm doing inside of Iran. Um, but yeah. Do we have another question? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. So that would be a question to uh, Little Miss Hotmess and Andrea, actually. So you guys said, you mentioned that uh, what your biggest concern is uh, the vulnerability of the minorities uh, due to the real name policy. I'm wondering, uh, first of all, I think we could like broaden that notion on many other social groups. They're not necessarily minorities, like for example, like corporate workers or even students, because there have been lots of cases when actually universities or employers were taking steps as an effect of identifying their employees or students and their activities in social media. But on the other hand, you mentioned that the main cause of real name policy would probably be uh, the willingness to have this sort of authenticity, as you called it. I'm wondering 
if that's the call for authenticity or security, because we need to weigh that and find like a right balance. Uh, because actually, I think that on one hand, there is security of all of the minorities, but on the other hand, there is this broader security, which we probably all know right now, especially with all of the hazards that general white internet brings, like terrorist hazards and identifying people. So I would like your uh, comment on, on that issue, where to find that balance. Thank you, that's a, that's a really good question. And I do believe that authenticity and online safety, that those two, that we don't really have to choose one of them because I think first of all, who gets to de decide what is uh, authentic identity? Are we really supposed to pre represent ourselves with only one name, one identity? And who gets, yeah, who gets to make this, this decision? Is it really a big company who wants to make money based upon our, our user data? Or is it a more personal choice, which I would think? And I think also, um, I think the, the argument that kind of, um, authentic identity um, kind of ensures online safety is the the kind of argument that's um, brought up is a lot uh, brought up a lot by the companies but for me I think I would really want to see more research showing that because I know there's also a lot of research out there saying okay um, real name requirements and authentic identity quote unquote is not really does not really ensure online safety. I hope this, this answered your question. Yeah, I'll just add that from my dealings with Facebook, I mean, they constantly sort of threw that line back at us and we're never able to substantiate it with any sort of research that actually showed that um, real names policies kept people safe. Um, and as I think we showed, you know, with the cyberbullying, we can see how it's a tool um, actually used to silence people. Um, and then I'll just add to that that the way that the policy and the procedures are structured, it's actually incredibly easy to use a pseudonym um, as long as it sort of, uh, yeah, as, well, as long as it looks like a real sort of English Anglo name. So, I mean, anyone can create a fake account with John Smith as the name and do whatever they want. They can harass women. They can go after people they've stalked. They can, you know, bully people. Um, so I think that, like, it's just, like, this just isn't the way to solve that problem. Um, and, and I also would add, too, that on sites like Facebook, like, you see a lot of community accountability. Um, there's certain tools built in to flag content or to report users and, and whatnot. But I think that, like, one of the things that Facebook I don't think understands in terms of creating this network of users is that people already have networks and they already have ways of maintaining social relationships. And this, you know, presents new challenges and opportunities, but, like, we, we know how to be social already. So. Of, course, of course, Facebook <laughs> wants you to believe that they invented social, so you know that's that's how it works for them. No, I mean I think this is uh, this is a really good point that actually you know society, individuals, countries, cultures are a lot more heterogeneous than some social media platforms would like us to believe, and that you know just because they have now. Um, whatever, six or seven different reactions to a post instead of just one, that, that still doesn't cover the whole complexity. And just because, you know, to them, um, whatever, they called it real name before, and now they call it whatever, authentic, um, or name you, you identify as authentic, to, it probably still doesn't capture the complexity of everything that your name, as you use it, means to you, right? Because as you said, there are, you know, Native Americans. There are all other kinds of min communities that use names in very different ways. You know, there are people who have d numeric digits as their middle names, and like, what do you do with those people? <laughs> is that a real name? Well, to them, it is. So I think the sort of takeaway for me is is that there's a lot more complexity than, th than corporations and um, and sort of governments want to believe there is and despite you know them trying to deny it and trying to say that oh you know we've provided for every possible option for your safety and security or for your peace of mind such as it may be there's actually a lot more chaos and messiness um, in in this world and 
hopefully kind of a better thinking about how we can design these spaces so that they're not just safe, but they also enable discussion, and enable different opinions, you know, and, and being able to bring some of that messiness in a constructive way is, is the way to go. So we're gonna end uh, on this hopeful note, and I want uh, us to give a solid round of applause to our wonderful panelists today. So we're, uh, we're ending the first sort of half day of, of our wonderful day one of the conference. We're uh, now have a break for food and uh, social. <laughs> As we said, we know how to do that. So um, on our location page on the website, you'll find a link to a range of places where you can get food, coffee, and other things that will sustain you until 6 p.m., which is when we have we will have uh, our first and then second keynote panel. So uh, go ahead, get some air, get some food, get some rest, and we'll see you at 6 p.m. And don't forget about the after party.